Welcome to Hollywood Graveyard, where we set out to remember and celebrate the lives of those who lived to entertain us by visiting their final resting places. Today we're exploring Forest Lawn Memorial Park in Glendale, where we'll find such stars as Walt Disney, Clara Bow, Sammy Davis Jr., and many more. Join us, won't you? Forest Lawn Glendale is the granddaddy of all cemeteries in Los Angeles. Spanning 300 acres with over a quarter of a million interments, this cemetery is massive. It was founded in 1906 and a few years later acquired by Dr. Hubert Eaton, whose vision was of a cemetery that was devoid of signs of earthly death and filled with beauty and serenity. He devised the term Memorial Park to give a more positive connotation than the word cemetery. On the grounds are several halls and chapels and two mausoleums including the majestic Great Mausoleum, which Time Magazine once called the New World's Westminster Abbey. There's also a museum, which regularly hosts fine art exhibits. But this entire cemetery could be considered a museum with the quality and quantity of art that is found here, including exact replicas of many Renaissance masterpieces, such as Michelangelo's David and the Pietà. But the crown jewel is surely the Last Supper window, a 30-foot stained glass depiction of Da Vinci's Last Supper. I'm afraid this video just doesn't do it justice. This window is truly breathtaking. As with the Hollywood Hills location, we'll be breaking this tour up into three parts due to its sheer size. For this first part, we'll be in the eastern section of the cemetery in an area known as the Court of Freedom. Similar to the Courts of Liberty at the Hollywood location, this area is devoted to American heritage and patriotism. We'll begin our tour at the Freedom Mausoleum on the east side. As we approach the mausoleum, our first stop will actually be just outside the entrance, in a small garden to the north. Here is a man who needs no introduction, Walt Disney. No name has become more synonymous with family entertainment than Disney. Young Walt started his own animation company, Laughagram, in his hometown of Kansas City before moving out to Los Angeles to start Disney Brothers Studios. There he produced a series of live-action animated hybrid shorts called the Alice Comedies. Their breakout came in 1928 when they introduced a new character to the world, Mickey Mouse, in a short called Steamboat Willie, in which audiences saw sound synced with the cartoon for the first time. In the years that followed, he produced the first cell animated feature film, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, and brought the world Disneyland. Contrary to urban legend, Walt was not cryogenically frozen. He was cremated, his ashes interred in this garden. Let's head into the mausoleum now to the first corridor on the right, the Sanctuary of Heritage. Here we'll find a handful of stars. On the wall to the right is Hollywood's it girl, Clara Bow, who was the quintessential flapper of the Roaring Twenties and is considered the leading sex symbol of the era. She starred in the 1927 film It, which earned her the moniker, The It Girl. Just above Clara is Alan Ladd, an actor who rose to prominence in the 1940s, particularly with his role as Raven in the film This Gun for Hire. His performance made him a star, and cemented his status as the ultimate tough guy in gangster, noir, and western films over the next 20 years. In 1953 he played the title role in the movie Shane, considered by many to have been his greatest role. Ladd's wife, Sue Carroll, had a brief career as an actress before becoming a talent agent. Alan was one of her clients. In the next column is singer and actress Jeanette MacDonald, who is best remembered for her roles in musical films of the 30s and 40s, starring alongside many of the era's leading men like Nelson Eddy and Clark Gable. Her films include San Francisco and Maytime. Above Jeanette is Nat King Cole, a singer and jazz pianist who was one of the most popular musicians of the 30s and 40s. I'm In 
In 1956, he became the first African-American man to host his own variety television show. In the next column, we find the shared crypt of legendary comedy couple Gracie Allen and George Burns. Younger generations will remember George Burns as the gravel-voiced, cigar-toting, bespectacled funny man who lived to the ripe old age of 100, receiving a Best Supporting Actor Oscar at the age of 80 for The Sunshine Boys. But he is perhaps best remembered as the straight man, delivering lines to his better half, his wife, and longtime partner Gracie Allen, who won the hearts of audiences on radio and television for her zany, ditzy character with a penchant for illogical logic. Their partnership began in vaudeville in the 1920s and went on to radio, film, and a successful television show in the 1950s. The George Burns and Gracie Allen show was revolutionary and paved the way for the modern sitcom. And here's an interesting fact. Fans of The Simpsons might recall the production company logo for Gracie Films after each episode. The company was named after Gracie Allen. After Gracie died in 1964, George visited her every month for 32 years until his own death, and insisted she get top billing on their crypt. Uh, goodbye, kid. See you next month. That, my friends, is undying love. Why? I love her, that's why. George never retired and died shortly after his 100th birthday, making him the only Hollywood performer to entertain audiences in every single decade of the 20th century. Thank you. Thank you very much. Gracie, that was a nice restaurant where we had dinner tonight. It yeah, wasn't it? Did you notice they had cheese souffle on the menu? Yes. Now, wouldn't you think they'd give you a clean one? <laughs> Sing it now. Back down the hall, in the columbarium of victory, is actress Dorothy Dandridge, who was the first African-American woman to be nominated for a Best Actress Oscar for her performance in Carmen Jones. She was also an accomplished singer, popular as a solo artist in nightclubs. She died in 1965 at just 42 after an accidental drug overdose. In 1993, she was honored as one of the four ladies of Hollywood, a gazebo-style gateway that stands at the western edge of the Hollywood Walk of Fame, which honors the multi-ethnic women of Hollywood. Let's head downstairs to the lower level. At the base of the stairs, right at eye level, is the crypt of Billy Dove, one of the most popular actresses of the 1920s. She began as a model in the Ziegfeld Follies before moving to Hollywood and starring in such films as The Black Pirate with Douglas Fairbanks. She had many male admirers, including Howard Hughes, with whom she had a relationship for many years. In the early 1930s, at the height of her popularity, Billy abruptly retired from the screen. We turn right at the next corridor and find the Sanctuary of Worship on the right. Along the right wall, way up near the top, is Chico Marx. Leonard Chico Marx was one of the four Marx brothers, a popular family comedy troupe in the first half of the 20th century. His name Chico is derived from the crafty, womanizing Italian persona he created. The oldest of the Marx Brothers, Chico became the group's manager and played an important role in their rise to fame. In the next corridor down, low on the left wall, is one of the Three Stooges, Larry Fine. The Three Stooges were one of the best known and beloved vaudeville and comedy acts of the 20th century, known for slapstick physical comedy. Say, how about this? One to grave diggers, good salary, applied No, for... no, two to morbid. The morbid, the merrier. No, no, no. Oh, no! Way down at the opposite end of the mausoleum is the Sanctuary of Gratitude. Here is the man with perhaps the grandest epitaph in town, king of the movies. Francis X. Bushman was one of the more popular actors of the silent era, known for roles in films like the 1925 epic Ben-Hur. Back outside, we turn right at the Washington statue and head into the Garden of Everlasting Peace. In the southeast corner of this garden is the grave of Spencer Tracy. A leading man of Hollywood's golden age, Spencer Tracy is considered one of the all-time great actors. He was nominated for nine Academy Awards, winning for Captains Courageous and Boys Town. While filming Woman of the Year in 1941, Tracy began a lifelong relationship with Katharine Hepburn, one of Hollywood's most legendary love affairs. Nearby is rugged and handsome actor Hugh O'Brien, who fell into acting quite by accident. While attending an audition with his actress girlfriend, the lead actor failed to show and he was asked to read. He got the part and thus began a long, successful career. His most notable role was as Wyatt Earp on the ABC Western series The Life and Legend of Wyatt Earp. 
He was also a humanitarian, dedicating much of his life to his non-profit youth organization, the Hugh O'Brien Youth Leadership. He married for the first time at the age of 81, right here at Forest Lawn. Just north of Hugh, near a small statue, is the grave of swashbuckling Australian actor Errol Flynn, who is remembered for his romantic action roles of the 30s and 40s, including The Adventures of Robin Hood and Captain Blood. On the far west side of this garden, next to the sidewalk, is Clayton Moore, the original Lone Ranger from the 1950s television show. The Lone Ranger! horse with the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty Hyo Silver, the Lone Ranger. The next garden to the west is the Garden of Honor. This is a private locked garden, so unless you or someone you know has a key, or by some miracle find the door open, unfortunately you won't be able to get in. Near the middle of the north side of the garden is Sammy Davis Jr., one of the great all-around entertainers of the 20th century. He could sing, act, dance, play a number of instruments, and could even do quite a few spot-on impersonations of other celebrities. He starred with other members of the Rat Pack in films like the original Ocean's Eleven, and had an unlikely hit in the song The Candy Man, which would become his signature song. Who can take a sunrise, to live with you? During his life, he was often billed as Mr. Show Business and the greatest living entertainer. At the south end of the garden is Sam Cooke, a singer and composer who is widely considered the king of soul. His hits include Wonderful World, Twist in the Night Away, and Cupid. Cupid, draw back your bow, and let your arrow go. Cook was shot and killed at just 33 during an altercation at the Hacienda Hotel. In the southwest corner of this garden is the unmarked grave of two Hollywood legends. Producer Samuel Goldwyn helped establish and develop many of the great film studios in early Hollywood. In 1913, he, along with Jesse Lasky and Cecil B. DeMille, formed a partnership to produce feature-length films. Their first effort was The Squaw Man, Hollywood's very first feature film. In 1916, Goldwyn started Goldwyn Pictures, which, when merged with two other companies, became Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer. Also interred here is director George Cukor, who directed many of the great films of Hollywood's golden era, including The Philadelphia Story and My Fair Lady, starring Audrey Hepburn. He was nominated for five Oscars, winning for My Fair Lady. It was an open secret that Cukor was homosexual, and in the 1930s he became a sort of head of Hollywood's gay subculture. The wife of Samuel Goldwyn, who was also interred in this garden plot, made arrangements to have Cukor buried next to her, as she considered him the love of her life, though their relationship remained platonic. In another part of the Garden of Honor, to the west, is the Columbarium of the Evening Star, High on the west wall is the niche of wise-cracking actress Joan Blondell. She starred in over 100 films and TV shows during her career, beginning in the 1930s. Her role in the 1951 film The Blue Veil earned her an Academy Award nomination. One of her last roles was in the movie Grease. And for all you pre-code enthusiasts out there, this promotional photo of Joan in the early 30s was later banned under the production code. Finally, we head to the far west section of this garden to visit Natalie Cole, the daughter of Nat King Cole who we visited earlier. As of filming, Natalie's grave is still unmarked. She rose to prominence as a singer in the 70s, but her greatest success came with the release of the 1991 album Unforgettable with Love. It featured standards by her father and other artists, including my personal favorite, Paper Moon. Say it's only a paper moon Sailing over a cardboard sea but it would be make believe if you believed in me. Unforgettable sold over 7 million copies and won 7 Grammy Awards. 
And that concludes our tour. What are some of your favorite memories of the stars we visited today? Share them in the comments below, and be sure to like, share, and subscribe for more famous grave tours. Thanks for watching, we'll see you on the next one. Welcome to Hollywood Graveyard, where we set out to remember and celebrate the lives of those who lived to entertain us by visiting their final resting places. I love this program. I never miss it. <laughs>